My grandparents, Neil and Jane Nellis, ended up having four children, all of whom eventually worked in Bible translation. Their family loved to laugh and sing and tell jokes. They had a small pump organ in those days that had been used by my grandmother's older sister in China until she was forced out of the country. My uncle writes, Singing praises to God is part of the lifestyle of the Nellis family. Jane had a beautiful and victorious voice that has been used to glorify God on numerous occasions and in many places. When Jane sang to God or about him, everyone knew that she meant every word that she was singing. And Neil is a perfect complement to Jane's ministry with his gifted and beautiful talent on the piano. Together, they have inspired and blessed many, and they have handed down this musical ministry to the lives of their children and grandchildren as well. So I thought it would be cool to hear some of their music. Let's begin by listening to my grandfather playing the piano at 90 years old. Calvary Bible Church decided that Jane should make an album, so a wonderful collection of sacred hymns was sung by Jane with accompaniment by superb musicians to produce the album Songs from the Heart. So let's listen to a clip from that. I am satisfied with done so much for me. He has suffered to redeem me. He has died to set me In 1947, my grandfather writes, It is Good Friday in Atepec and a very special time for us to remember Christ's sacrifice for us. As we look around us at those Zapotecs who still cling to idols, gods made out of wood and clay, or evil spirits who laugh at the poor souls that look to them for healing, it makes us realize that it was important for us to come to this remote part of the world. As men were out in the dirt streets parading their idols for Good Friday, other Zapotecs came to our house. They said, please help us learn about God and his letter to us. Out of this group, the Lord touched Jacob, a splendid young man of 27 years who earnestly and completely has decided to surrender his life and work to the Lord. He has offered to work with us in order that God's word be translated into Zapotec. One day he came to work and told us with a radiant countenance that he had destroyed his household idols. This is such an important step for a new believer to take. They must make a complete break with the old ways in order to grow in their newfound faith. He has stopped drinking alcoholic beverages and he has such a simple faith and love for things of the Lord. My grandmother writes, There was a woman named Luisa who was one of the strongest opponents of the gospel in Atepec. She was always a good friend of ours, and she would like to visit us and sing hymns, but she was one of the most active members in the Catholic Church in the community. She belonged to a group called the Heart of Mary, and was very well known for her hard work and contributions to the church. She had several children, two of which were a little girl named Esperanza, who was 12 years old, and Paulino, who was just 7 years old. Every night at 7 p.m., the church bell would ring, and everyone was supposed to go to the altar and pray. Well, Esperanza had been receptive to the word and the gospel, so she told her brother that idols couldn't see or hear, and they couldn't help us, and God is the only one we should worship. The next time that the family went to church, Paulino's mother said, Paulino, it's time to go and kneel in front of the altar. He responded, 
Oh, mom, they're just wood and they won't help me. Luisa was so mad, she took him by the back of the head and threw him face forward onto the ground and sent him out without his supper that night. He had to sit behind the house. Esperanza saved some of her supper and took it out to him. The next time we went on furlough, Luisa made sure that her daughter Esperanza married an unbeliever. The night before the wedding, I didn't know that it was taking place, I woke up about 3 a.m. and prayed for her, that the Lord would protect her and keep her. Esperanza's husband, Ubaldo, was insanely jealous of her and would whip her and was very cruel. Two or three times she came to our house when she could get away and she would plead with me, please let me run away with you. It just broke my heart. It was a sad situation which we requested prayer for. Her husband, Ubaldo, was a drunk and cruel to the end. Esperanza had seven children by him and was having complications in the eighth. So she was going to the hospital, but before she went, she knelt down on the floor and committed all of her children to the Lord. It was as if she knew she wouldn't make it, and she died having her last child. Now, Luisa's son, Paulino, grew up and later became a believer through an interesting intervention of providence. Later, Luisa became very sick, and another one of her sons who worked as the village police was stabbed to death. God used all of these things to lead her to Christ eventually. When she became a Christian, the Catholic Church was so shocked that the news even reached the Archbishop of the state of Oaxaca. My grandfather goes on to write, We can also rejoice that we have been able to finish the first draft of the Gospel of John in Zapotec. Praise God for his faithfulness. It will need a lot of revision and polishing, but now the Sapotex will begin to get a glimpse of the true and only God and the one and only salvation through Jesus Christ. We have been trying to share this message with our next door neighbors for a long time. And finally, the wife, Maria, has accepted Christ as Savior. We are still praying for her husband. Now, as an aside, during these years, my grandparents were suffering from bouts of malaria and typhoid, as well as a heart flutter that my grandpa developed for a time, and it really scared them. In 1949, they spent some time on furlough, and they write, We are now preparing to return to our much-loved Sabatec friends. We have received correspondence from them this year, and they have continued steadfast in the faith. Jacob's letters sound like the Acts of the Apostles. Jacob is our language helper who has been the teacher and leader during our absence, and he is our joy and crown. We've been loaded down with many benefits during this furlough. God has provided the Sapotec work with a nurse, Iva Chizuk. Several people have provided us with two typewriters. One is a primer type that can type large letters for helping with literacy materials. And we were also given a mimeograph machine, as well as money for a horse, saddle, trunks, a four-foot kerosene-operated refrigerator, linens, clothes, and household items and money gifts. We're so overwhelmed with the goodness of God and the generosity of his people. So who was Iva Chizik? In the summer of 1949, Iva was stationed at Long Beach, California. Iva was a U.S. Navy nurse. Now, a Christian dietitian invited Iva to attend a missionary prayer meeting. Jane was to speak at the Orthodox Presbyterian Church in Long Beach. Iva had been a Christian for five years, but had never heard of the ministry of Wycliffe Bible Translators. Jane gave a moving challenge, sharing about the work of Wycliffe worldwide and in Mexico among the Sierra Juarez Zapotecs. Iva was especially moved about the plight of the indigenous people and their health problems. There was a problem of people losing their sight because of some type of microorganism in the water. Jane's mom, Mary Goodner, said that she had never felt such a strong presence of the Holy Spirit as when Jane spoke that night. It seemed that the Lord was saying over and over to Iva, Who will go for me? And Iva kept saying to the Lord, Here I am, send me. So she arrived at Jane's elbow almost before she had finished sharing. 
Iva's grandmother was Czechoslovakian and a follower of the martyred reformer John Huss. She was beaten for reading her Bible and was faithful to the Lord all of her life. Some of that faith and perseverance was passed on to Iva. One of Iva's first cases in the village was all the way up the side of a mountain. Iva got on a horse and began riding it up to the home of a sick lady named Candelaria. On the way, the cinch on the horse became loose and Iva fell to the hard clay ground and was seriously injured. She said that she couldn't believe that God would bring her all the way out there only to have her back be broken. But she prayed that if that was his will, then so be it. She recovered almost immediately, and it was like his sign of approval. The rural clinic had not come yet, and there was not even a store that sold medicines in town. When we first arrived, we treated people with sulfa drugs. Then penicillin was developed, but it was the crude kind that really had a sting to it. Iva hated to give these shots to anyone because of the pain involved, but it was all that we had in those early days. Our policy until now has been that we don't charge the people for any medicine. Instead, we tell them about Jesus and about the people in the U.S. who trust in him and are providing this medicine for them. We have at one time or another treated almost all of the 2,000 Sabateks that live in this village of Atepec. Many people will bring gifts of vegetables as a token of gratitude. It's so exciting to see the little flock of believers grow. We now have two services on Sunday. There are about 30 faithful in attendance. During the week, Neil studies and helps the man who will do the teaching. That way he can disciple them and the church will have Sapotec leaders in its pulpit and not just the same missionary year after year. The first generation of school children is learning to read. This means that as the word of God is being translated, there will be readers anxiously waiting to receive it. About the first week in December, a fine-looking Sapotec man came to our home and told Neil that he wanted to become a disciple of the Lord. We had heard that he had destroyed his idols and was determined that his family should destroy theirs because he now sees the foolishness of worshiping stone idols. How wonderful it is to see this man and others leave a demon-controlled, idol-worshiping, animistic religion for a relationship with the living Christ which is not based on fear and oppression, but love and fellowship. Many of the Sabatec believers are paying a heavy price for their faith. Jewel was the second child we lost in Mexico. We know how to relate to the Sabatec people who lose their children to different diseases. We can share a message of comfort with them and partake of it ourselves. We know that God doeth all things well and our confidence is in Him. Heaven is that much richer, knowing that two of ours are there. Jewel was our first child born in Mexico City. God is bringing more people into the Sapotec Church daily through evangelism and church discipline. The women are realizing that they need to learn to read their language. So several of them have begun coming to two weekly reading classes. For the present, we are seeing that living the Christian life is almost as effective a witness as the spoken witness. The native believers are learning that robbery and divorce need to be disciplined by the church. Also, now they know that a believer should not marry an unbeliever. Small moral victories have been won. Two believers who wanted a divorce are now together again. Seven couples who have been living together for several years have recently gotten their medical certificates and are on their way to legal marriage. A man named Tachu was a dear Sapotec friend that was led to Christ by To Jacob, the first one to believe from our ministry. Tachu was a man that had grown up through the years wondering if there was a real God and how he could ever get to know him. When he was a young boy, he had been an altar boy in the Catholic Church. When he heard about Jacob's experience and how he had destroyed all of his idols and how his life had changed, he decided to find out what had happened. One day, as they were working out in the field together, he said, Jacob, tell me about these new things that the foreigners have brought to us. 
So Jacob did, and Tachu gave his heart to Christ. Tachu became filled with the spirit and evangelistic zeal and did great things for Christ in the Sierra Juarez mountains. He went on countless missionary trips from village to village witnessing. What a sweet and refreshing spirit he had. He was a humble man and a mighty servant of God. He was out working in the cornfield one day, and a Sapotec man was working with an earshot. It was too great an opportunity for Tachu, so he witnessed to the man. Just after that, while they were still both working, a very poisonous viper bit Tachu. This particular viper either caused swelling and severe sickness or death. Normally, when someone is bitten by a snake, it means that you've done something wrong and you're being punished. Tachu didn't want people to believe that about his conversion to Christianity. So he got on his knees and prayed that the Lord would heal him and spare his life. God answered, and he never suffered ill effects from that bite. Tachu was just radiant when he showed us the two fang marks in his toe. It was also a real testimony to the other fellow in the cornfield with him that day. One day he said, Juanita, don't you have time to teach me how to read? I want to go to San Pedro and Andrajes de la Luz and Luvina and Bersunia. I want to go to all of these villages nearby, but I don't know how to read. Can you take some time to teach me? Well, my children were very small and the twins were babies and Mary Jane was just toddling along and Donnie running through the house, plus medical work. But I would sit down from time to time and teach Tachu how to read. He wasn't an exceptional student, but he did learn. He never stopped going on missionary journeys after that, always carrying portions of the word. It wasn't too many years after that that he came to Ishmiquilpan, Hidalgo, Mexico, with us to help us in a translation workshop. He helped Neil to translate Revelation. Tachu would come by our house each morning and would call out, Ta Miguel! And Neil would say, what is it, Tachu? He would say, could you come pretty soon? I can't wait to see what is going to happen in that next chapter of Revelation. Another day he said, you know, Ta Miguel, the translation is just like a big cornfield. It's getting taller and greener every day. Nearly every time we have left the village, Tachu will come over and kneel down on the floor and commend our way and safety to the Lord. Many people believe that the over 3,000 people groups around the world that live in agrarian, animistic, close-to-nature, non-technological societies are living in bliss and tranquility. However, those who labor with and live around these people groups realize that many of these groups live in fear with low life expectancy, and it is not the idyllic dream that many would have us believe. The following prayer letter from Iva Chizik gives some more insight into the Sapotec culture and reality. She writes, The whole head is sick, and the whole heart is faint. From the sole of the foot even unto the head, there is no soundness in it, but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. They have not been closed, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment. Isaiah 1, 5, and 6. She says, The above verse from Isaiah was written as he lamented the spiritual plight of the heathen nations. What a contrast to many at home who have advised me to leave the heathen alone. They are happy in their ignorance and with their own gods, they say. Only the missionary who goes beyond the ranges knows the true plight of the heathen, truly physically and spiritually. There is Nestor, nephew of a witch doctor, who is frightful to look at, with part of the flesh and all of the skin gone from one side of his face, neck, and chest. He has been in this condition for six years, ever since a tree fell on him. He had refused our many offers to send him to the missionary hospital in Puebla for skin grafts. Also, Dr. Meadows' generous offer to hospitalize him and do plastic surgery without charge. 
He has been told by his uncle that the doctors will open him up and will put evil spirits in him and that he will die when they operate on him and perhaps come back to life when the operation is over. He came to our clinic recently, his wounded face grotesquely distorted, driven to despair because of the pain and the stench from his wounds. He finally said he was willing to go to the hospital. There is also little Serena, who was carried by her father to our clinic late at night, writhing in pain from acute mastoiditis. I discovered on examination that her mastoid cavity and infected earlobe were filled with maggots. I removed about 50, then lost count. Her mother had recently died without having received Christ, and her father, offended by the gospel, neglected to bring her to us until her case became desperate. Agustina is wasting away with advanced tuberculosis and came to us with tear-filled eyes, pleading for me to make her well so that she can follow Christ. We hope that her death will be as peaceful as little Celia's, another tuberculosis patient who recently died in the Lord, having found her Redeemer shortly before her death. Providentially, this young girl, charmed with life in the big city, had returned to Atepec seriously ill and was compassionately received into the home of one of the Sapotec believers. When I step over the threshold of a native adobe hut to minister to the sick, I never know what I will find. As my eyes get accustomed to the darkness, usually under a heap of rags or an old blanket, I find a poor creature who is disease-ridden that the world has forgotten, but a merciful Lord has sent me to minister to. I often marvel at God's grace that transformed my own heart and brought me out of the U.S. Navy Nurse Corps to serve Him in this needy land. As I see their lives transformed like mine was by His precious Word and the regenerating power of the Holy Spirit, I can say like Paul, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Can you imagine yourself having a gunshot wound in the chest and not even having an aspirin tablet to relieve your pain? Before we came to Atepec, the native pastor, now Jacob, had accidentally shot himself with a rifle. With no medical aid available, he wanted to take his own life. Fortunately, his fellow tribespeople wouldn't allow him. He was the first Sapotec in Atepec to accept Christ when Neil and Jane came with the good news. So that's a little bit from Iva. Now let's continue with the story from my grandparents' perspective. In February, the president of the community, the director of the rural school, and other town officials came to request us to help with some donations for the school. Also, they want us to make a bilingual primer and a dictionary for the adults that are not literate. Erlindo, a native Zapotec evangelist, is making regular witnessing and Bible teaching trips to all the Zapotec villages, beginning with those situated in the north. He's so dedicated to travel over these high, rocky trails in the Sierra Juarez Mountains to carry the good news. Neil will sometimes go with him, and the church here also sends a man out to accompany Erlindo at their own expense. We're working on a first draft of Romans. I, Neil, am working four hours a day with Jacob on the translation. Then there is preparation and teaching of literacy courses, working on the primer and dictionary, as well as correspondence, counseling, and regular household duties, which pretty much take up the hours. Jane is very occupied with the women's reading classes. There's a group in town trying to pressure the people into abandoning their language in favor of Spanish. But there are so many who don't understand Spanish well. The believers are conducting the services in Zapotec currently, and we sure wish that there was a faster, more efficient way of translating the New Testament to get it into the hands of the people, but there seems to be no other way than verse by verse. We're glad to have the Gospels of Matthew and John done and in the hands of the people, but now they need the epistles and we're just barely doing Romans. 
Now, Dorothy Wright, a friend of ours for many years in Wycliffe, has joined our team. She's really diving into the study of this difficult tonal language. It's so important to get the right tone on each word. You can have three words written the same way, and the only difference between them is the tone. One word spoken with different tones can mean either rock, rain, or flower. Neil has translated Silent Night into Sabatek, but the people would laugh every time he sung it. We found out later that he was singing Silent Shoe, Holy Shoe. Shoe and night are written the same way, but it's the tone that will tell you what you are saying. So it is a rather tricky language to learn, and there are some serious consequences in the translation if you aren't careful. The language has a very important double T and a single T. In John 3.16, where it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, the Sapotec verb for gave is guti, and the word for kill is guti with two t's. The whole meaning of the verse could be seriously changed by the addition of one letter or by the raising or lowering of the tone. It makes language learning, as well as literacy, very challenging. Dorothy is helping Jane in the women's reading classes and in the development of reading books. She has such a sweet personality, and she also plays the accordion, which is welcome on so many occasions. Now, you can actually go online to scriptureearth.org and listen to recordings of this New Testament that my grandfather did. So, I thought I'd play a little clip from Romans chapter 1. So you can hear what the language sounds like. This is actually a recording that Faith Comes by Hearing did more recently than the recordings that gospel recordings did back in the day when my grandparents were there. Inte Pablo runya norine ni Jesucristo a inte na na apostol kie porque ni tata Dios na chigutarie inte chibeku e inte para que sa evangelio kie ka bendición nuralo evangelio na. Tata Dios na cha venie prometer desde va antes kini ithele ka lani riu. Shortly after we had published the Gospel of Matthew and distributed it in the village, word got around the community that it was causing division and bloodshed. The president of the village just happened by God's providence to be living in our house at the time. His only granddaughter, whom he loved very much, had been brought to our home for medical treatment. It didn't look good for her as she was dying of pneumonia. We were treating the little girl as best we could. Jane had built a little tent of curtain material and was giving her vapor treatment so she could breathe. She was just a baby. We did everything we could and prayed, and she got better. The government had heard about the accusations and sent a letter of inquiry to the community. The president wrote back, These people are doing nothing but good deeds to us. I don't believe what is being said about them, and I take no part in it. He was a fine man and a very good friend. Jacob is at the ranch now. We finished Hebrews chapter 10 last week, so there are still three more chapters to do in Hebrews, plus Acts and Revelation, plus the checking of Mark and Luke, which he did alone. God is distributing his spiritual gifts, and the church has a good balance of preachers, teachers, singers, and witnessers. However, there are still so many obstacles to be removed before there can be an outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the village. Sometimes I'm discouraged about the quality of the translation, and at other times it seems so perfect. But one thing is for sure, it is desperately needed now because we are at a spiritual standstill without it. Now at this point, there's a section in the book where we have longer meditations from my grandfather on some of the harder challenges and discouragements he was facing. And this came at a time where he was in the village alone. So the nurse, Iva, had had to go back to the States because of Malta fever that she was struggling with. And my grandmother and the kids were away for some reason. And so he had a lot of time to write and kind of ruminate on some of these issues. So he says, Things have not been going so well in the native church as they should. Too many hidden things, lack of frankness and openness, lack of power in witnessing. But praise the Lord, 
it's clearing up. The church leaders are mainly to blame. Levity, horseplay, and suggestive remarks. For many years, I have been in the dark about suggestive remarks in the language. The tone pairs are so frequent, and so many dirty words are said by just a change of the tone and suggestion. Thanks to some of my friends and the Lord helping me with the language, I've been able to discern some of these things and do some rebuking and exhorting. One such remark can upset the seriousness and work of the Spirit for the entire meeting. Two of the leaders, especially, are quick with the tongue and witty and have been deep in sin, so it was nothing for them to slide into the habit of making others laugh about some remark, usually in the sex line of marriage, birth, etc., I used to smile right along with the crowd, thinking that it was some innocent thing that I didn't understand. But now the Lord is helping me to bring to light these things, first in myself and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. One thing the Lord spoke to me about is that I've been too ready to push off leadership onto the natives that I myself need to assume. At least until the Lord gives us the right man, maybe Salomon, who is in Bible school in Guatemala now, there is a great need for a Sapotec spiritual leader whom the people will respect, who can exhort and rebuke. This is a painful ministry that no one in particular enjoys doing. I had let things go too long in the area of Christian correction. I thought I didn't know the language well enough or thought it wasn't my place because of cultural background differences, but now I know that they look up to me for spiritual guidance and that I am not treading on forbidden ground to be absolutely frank with them about myself and about them. Two of the elders are especially close in heart and willing to grow spiritually. Another elder is off course and has not yet repented. Another, Tobias, is in Georgia working as a migrant worker picking cotton. Another of the leaders is at his farm in the mountains, and another, who is here, has hookworm or something. Every time he sits down, he falls asleep, so he's not of much use. God has given us a fine leader apart from the elders of the church. He is Tobias's brother, Hinaro. He's older than the rest, has a clean-cut conversation, and is alert and has a teachable attitude. He gave a message last Sunday night about having to be like a child to enter the kingdom of heaven. It was well presented with good spiritual insight, but he's anxious to go to California where they pay a dollar an hour and he can team up with his brother and buy some modern conveniences. The poverty is acute here and they want a change. Menelio, the talented young native who is so musical, is in Texas picking cotton for 50 cents an hour. He's needed here. His sister and brother-in-law he won to Christ are far from being faithful. Can we overestimate the influence we have on other lives? Sometimes the presence of a spiritual leader is all that is needed to turn a life to Christ or to restore someone who has fallen away. The economic situation and lack of food and clothing puts an emphasis on material needs. Rarely do they pray without asking first for enough to eat for today. There seems to be more resignation than hope, a quiet resigning to what they believe is their lot in life. They're thankful for their life in Jesus Christ, but life is hand to mouth. There's little order and little change in the routine daily responsibilities and planting and harvest time for just a little to eat. Most don't tithe. There are not many who can be trusted to keep the offerings if there is hunger in the home. In 1954, they had twins, my mom and my uncle, Dorothy and David. At the time, their daughter, Mary Jane, was still in diapers. Here's a little anecdote about the challenges. It was a very difficult pregnancy for Jane. She suffered from preeclampsia. She was very swollen and had kidney problems. This caused the doctor to deliver them cesarean. On the way to the village this year, Jane fell off of our mule and broke the thumb of her left hand. This was very serious because Jane is left-handed. The twins were in diapers. Mary Jane was in diapers. There were no disposable diapers available, not yet invented. And it is very hard to pin a diaper without a thumb. 
The little Sapotec church in the village of Atepec that had developed into a fair-sized congregation was interested in affiliating with a denomination at this point. Wycliffe's policy is not to promote denominationalism, but to allow the indigenous church to develop relationships that will encourage growth with a mainline denomination in their area. In the case of the Sapotec Church, the largest denomination was the Mexican National Presbyterian Church. We had helped develop leaders through the biblical methodology of discipleship. The National Presbyterian Church was the only one that they knew anything about. However, when the indigenous leaders from the Atepec Church went to Oaxaca, they made many observations and brought back a lot of Western influence that we had tried to ignore We wanted the indigenous church to develop biblically and be led by the Holy Spirit and not so much influenced by external accoutrements. So they came back and insisted on building a platform and having rows of benches. They said, we want to be like the rest of the Mexicans. We had been using the Fe y Alabanza, faith and worship hymnal, but they opted for the more serious, sedate, slow Western hymns that the Presbytery uses. I suppose they weren't bad changes, and we had very little input, as this is what we had trained the leaders to do, to make independent decisions. They also appointed elders, deacons, and deaconesses, and also some presbytery representatives. Neil is still working diligently on checking scripture. Then Dorothy Wright and Helen came to work on the Sapotec hymnal. It's amazing what needs to be done in this type of ministry. The translation, teaching, writing hymns, medical work, literacy, and the preparation of literacy materials, witnessing, discipleship, and counseling. Since very few people can do all of these things well, we look to God for guidance, wisdom, strength, and grace. And at this point, they share that they've gotten electricity in the village, access to electricity, which has made the evening services in the church a little brighter, and that they have finished the book of Galatians, and one of the elders of the church is leading the congregation through that. And now we arrive at 1970. They write, This is the day that the Lord hath made. The Sierra Juarez Zapotec New Testament is finished, printed, and the first copy has been put into the hands of a waiting Zapotec believer. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. What a milestone. What an achievement. God made it possible in spite of many odds and the principalities and powers of darkness who opposed this humble work. Now God speaks to the Zapotecs in their tongue. The following is an excerpt from Translation, the Wycliffe Bible Translators Magazine, October through December, the 1970 issue, page 13. Zapotec New Testament Dedicated The Sierra Juarez Zapotec New Testament was presented to the people in special meetings on Saturday, June 6th, and Sunday, June 7th. A dinner was held on Saturday afternoon at the home of Neil and Jane Nellis, the translators. Honored guests, in addition to members of the congregation and WBT members, were Iva Chizik, former Wycliffe nurse who had a clinic in Atepec, representatives from the World Home Bible League, founder William Chapman, Mexico director Reverend Chester A. Shemper, and Licenciado Efraín Espinosa of the Mexican Home Bible League. The Reverend Francisco Penate, one of the pastors of the Chol Churches in Chiapas, was present and participated in the activities. The main service of presentation was on Sunday morning in the local Presbyterian church that has developed out of the work of Neil and Jane in Atepec. Elpidio Perez, one of the main translation helpers for the New Testament and presently a full-time evangelist, led the main service. Licenciado Efraín Espinosa, representing the World Home Bible League, officially dedicated the New Testament. Director Frank Robbins then presented to the analysis specially bound copies of the Testament on behalf of the Mexico branch of Wycliffe. Of particular note is that Neil and Jane's oldest son, Don, a new member of Wycliffe, is planning to work with his wife, Jane, in a Mistec group of Mexico, and he typed the manuscript for the New Testament. 
So that's it, 1970. Can you believe it? I would still not be born for another 12 years. Now, in this book, my grandparents remember fondly Uncle Cam after his death at 85 years old. They write, Uncle Cam always loved to hear Jane sing. If she was ever near an SIL chapel or where a group was gathered, Uncle Cam would always ask Jane to sing. One of his favorites was L.L. Letger's theme song, Faith, mighty faith, the promise sees and looks to God alone, laughs at impossibilities and shouts, it shall be done. Once Uncle Cam heard Jane sing this, and when it came to the part, laughs at impossibilities, Jane laughed. Then she shouted, it shall be done. After that, Uncle Cam would always ask Jane to sing it that way. When he went to his heavenly reward in April of 1982, Elaine asked Jane to come and sing and Neil to play some of his favorite hymns. What a wonderful legacy and challenge he left behind. In his report to the group in 1965, he said, Dear ones, we've had problems. In some ways, this past year is the hardest I've ever had. It's been my own fault. I know what God says. Cast your burdens on the Lord and he will sustain thee. And I didn't do it. But he has brought us through. And dear ones, I want us all to continue to adhere to our basic policies. What are our basic policies? First, to give the word of God to every tribe in his own tongue. Translate the word of God. Secondly, we pioneer. Third, we excel in linguistics. Fourth, we serve all we can. And fifth, we trust God for the impossible. Dear ones, the Lord is with us. The Lord has called us to a tremendous task. He is more than sufficient. The victory is ours through him. He will give us the land. He will deliver his word into the vernacular through us and the others he will raise up to all the tribes, whether there be 2,000, 3,000, or 4,000 more, they shall all be reached. My grandparents go on to write, we have been associated with Wycliffe for 46 exciting years. God has helped us to translate portions of the Old Testament and the complete New Testament. We have done a literacy program with primers, a dictionary, grammar, and reading books. We have trained and discipled many Sopotecs, done medical work, taught music, helped choirs and programs, participated in community projects, sent Sopotecs to schools of higher education, done group service and public relations and hospitality, counseling, discipleship, and a few other things. We even had a part in beginning a radio program in Sabatec. Now there are many trained pastors and leaders, churches, and Christian workers. God has led us all the way. Now we will start down a new path in August 1988. We are joining United Indian Mission to help out in their church planting effort along with our children Don and Janie Nellis, Dave and Wendy Nellis, and Dan and Dorothy Case. Donnie is working out of Los Angeles, and the rest of us are developing a church in Oaxaca, Mexico. United Indian Mission has warmly received us into their mission, a blessing which we believe the Lord has prepared for us. We can serve the Lord in the area of evangelism, discipleship, teaching, hospitality, and music, and still see and help our Sapotec friends. God's mercies are new every day. Great is his faithfulness. And so I would like to end this episode with two recordings. One, a clip from the story of Noah in Sapotec, and two, a clip of the whole church singing together with my grandfather playing the organ in the background. Both of these are ancient recordings done with a phonograph. Thank you.